Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah, turn the back of the book of uh, Acts chapter 2 with me. Acts 2. Verse 1. chapter number 2 and verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Father, anoint your word, and the messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can follow on and you can count 16 different locations that they heard in their own language the marvelous works of God. As the prophecy in the Old Testament said that, that God said that with another tongue I'll speak to this people. And we find here in the book of Acts chapter number 2 on the day of Pentecost, the 50th day after Passover, this is one of the great feast days of the Jewish faith, that the Holy Spirit came down and anointed the church. He literally gave it its life. Because before this, they were in fear, the Jews, and they were hiding, and, and, uh, and, they, and there was no real, uh, no real power, none. But if you notice in verse 1, it says, the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with all all. Uh, with one accord in one place. Man, that's something right there. If you can have that, you've got something. <laughs> you get them all with one accord in one place. And the reason we should come together is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we gather around for. That's what we're about, folks. It's about the Son of God. But in Acts chapter number 2, you have what's commonly concerned or considered to be the birth of the church. Now, the church was here before that. He said, Matthew 16, verse 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. It's a called out assembly. But what you're talking about here is, a, is, a, is the literal, uh, the, uh, the joining together in power and unction of the church of the living God. Because what happened in Acts chapter number 2 completely changed them. And when it changed them, they were changed for good. And I thank God for that. Amen. I thank God for that. Now, in the 1800s, Charles Darwin came out with his, uh, with his uh, mythology, his novel, his mythology, on the origin of the species. They call it the theory of evolution. It's nothing in the world more than a novel, a piece of, uh, of, uh, of a mythology created in the mind of a, a hallucinogenic individual that he hallucinated, all right? But now Darwin was not original with the idea of evolution. You can go all the way back to Plato, and you can trace evolution back to him. But when that did happen, it became the foundation and the framework for all of the apostasy and the liberal progressivism that we are dealing with today. They used that against the Bible. They used the so-called uh, idea of evolution to destroy and uh, the idea that there's a creator, a designer, and that there's a reason for people living, and there's a reason for you being here, and there's a reason in your design. Uh, God had a reason for making us, and he had a reason for putting us on this earth. Evolution is blind chance. There is no reason. There is no reason. It's just, uh, you know, it's like Dawkins says. We're just here. We're just, we're just living things, and, and where we came from is a total mystery, and where we're going is a total mystery, and we're just here, and that's it. And that's the, that's the, the uh, theology of an atheist. Uh, you know, a man like that can't give you any comfort, can he? He can't because he has none himself. But it's sad. But the reason I mention that is because that happened in the 1800s, that book came out. 
But back in the 1700s, before that book was ever published in this country, uh, faith in Christ was pretty dead. It had dried up and uh, needed, uh, needed the power of God. Now, the power of God came in Acts chapter number 2 in the power of the Holy Spirit. But uh, the early colonists apparently had uh, suffered a lot of things, and uh, they no doubt had had uh, quite a connection with uh, the Church of England. Hard to break away from that because the Church of England, a lot of formalism. But in any event, God moved in the 1700s in a real movement of God, and we call it the Great Awakening. And that Great Awakening was so profound that it changed the course of American history. God used men like George Whitfield. George Whitfield, they would not ordain him. They, he wasn't part of the, uh, the, 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 the good old boy club. They wouldn't ordain him. But Whitfield said, God's called me to preach. And he says, therefore, this field, the world, is my parish. And he went and he started preaching. And thousands came to hear him preach. They did because God's hand was upon George Whitfield. God had anointed him. The last thing Whitfield said when he was sick, been in bed for days, but he got up. He came downstairs and he said to the people in the room, he said, I want to go at least one more time. Let me go one more time out into the fields and proclaim his name before I leave this world. The last thing George Whitfield wanted to do was to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whitfield was something. He went out into the forest in, I guess it was in England, and he spent a solid year out there, a year living uh, in the forest alone, away from people, away from uh, any outside contact. And say, what did he do that for? He wanted to make absolutely certain that his faith in Christ was real. He wanted to know that he knew that he knew that he knew that he was born of the Spirit of God. And when Whitfield came out of the woods, been out there a year, when he came back, he was a different man, a completely different man. He had a foundation. He had a faith in Christ. He knew whom he had believed and was persuaded that God was able to do what he said he would do. God used Whitfield then. A man by the name of Jonathan Edwards showed up not long after that. Jonathan Edwards was quite a man. He wrote a lot. He wrote a lot of theological journals and so forth. And you can study his work and you'll find that Jonathan Edwards had quite a grasp of the scriptures. But he's mostly famous for the fact that uh, he read a sermon one time called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now listen carefully. He read it. He read it. Jonathan Edwards read that sermon and men and women got up out of their seats and literally fell to the floor under the conviction of God. Yeah. They were weeping and they were wailing. And they were being born again. They were being saved. Why? Conviction was there. Yeah. It was not brought on by theatrical tactics. It was yeah. not brought on by talent and ability. It was not brought on by production. It was not brought on by a show. Yeah. A man simply read a, script, read a sermon. Yeah. And the power of the Holy Spirit fell on those people. Yeah. And God began to save them. America's had revivals out in the woods. They call them uh, uh, brush harbor meetings. Uh, we've had revivals down through the years, uh, tent revivals. Billy Graham started with a tent out in California, and uh, he started preaching, and he preached all over the country in tents. People came by the thousands to hear Billy Graham preach. Oral Roberts put his tent up and carried it all over the nation. And men and women would come to hear Oral Roberts preach. You can watch some of the old videos of uh, Oral Roberts. They'll show them on that station that comes out of Virginia up there. You can see where he's out preaching. Tent preaching has been part of American culture as far back as we can remember. God has blessed tent meetings. He has blessed tent meetings. Uh, in some cases, the tent meeting has produced something good for the glory of God. Sometimes the tent meeting was nothing in the world more than a ripoff to take the money of the people, a fly-by-night character who took their money and packed his tent up and he was gone the next day. And so people had to get discernment. They had to learn what they were dealing with. And it always came back to what God said he would do. He said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. They had their church. They came back to the church. They came back to the foundation. They came back to what pulled the families together. 
They came back to where the people were taught, where they had a pastor, somebody they knew would be there, somebody that they knew for years, somebody that they trusted. And God raised up his pastors. And down through the years, the pastors in this country have been, we've had, we've had some wonderful pastors, no question about it. Pastored for 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 years pastoring a local New Testament church. And some been gone for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and the people still talk about them. And they talk about how much they love them because they were there for them. There's a, there's a place for the pastor. There's a place for the evangelist. There's a place for the missionary. There's a place for, you know, all of these different uh, callings in the body of Christ. There's a place for them. And we need to seek the face of God and ask him, about this, about how he builds his church. He said he puts some in the, he, in, in the family of God. He calls some a prop, a prophets, some evangelists, some uh, missionaries, some teachers. The church of God needs teachers. We need them badly. We need men and, and, and women that will study the word of God and be able to teach the people. We have to root them and ground them in the faith. It is a shame for a man to try to pastor a church and be ignorant of the Bible. He may mean well, but he's not doing, he's, he's hurting more than he's helping. Amen. Because he's the one that God puts in the front to deal with heresy when it shows up. He's got to be the one that knows what he believes and why he believes it. So, uh, you know, Baptists have always been lax when it comes to that. You take the Presbyterian Church and the Methodists and some of the rest of them. You don't pastor their churches until you've been to school. Right. You don't do it. Right. You don't do it. Right. And there's a reason for that. They want, a young, they want a young man to at least have some training before he jumps up in the pulpit and starts pastoring. I'm an aberration. I'm an aberration. I got saved in 1973. I came here in 76. Now, how much greener can you be than that? I'm a quick learner. I always have been. Yes, I learn quickly, very quickly. But even at that, three years, you know, I was a babe in Christ when I came to temple. But God does make exceptions to the rule. At least I'd think so. I'm here 42 years. You're going to take me out now? I mean, say, we're not, you fail the test? <laughs> but you see, the point is, if I, were, if I were talking to a young man right now about uh, pastoring a church, I'd say, first thing you need to do, you need to get some training. You need to get some training. You need to go to a good Bible, uh, a good Bible college or Bible institute somewhere and, 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 and study the Word of God. And equip yourself. The Bible said, study to show thyself approved to God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I got my education through, uh, uh, through I've, been, I've been to Bible college, Bible institutes, and 42 years of personal Bible study. I've sat in the classroom down through the years, put many hours in studying, passing exams and all of that. I don't make a big deal about it. You know why I don't make a big deal about it? All you got to do is listen to a man. All you got to do is listen to him. And you can tell if he's ever studied or not, if he knows anything. Mean well won't get the job done. Meaning well won't do it. What he needs to do if he's not prepared is to sit in a church. Go join up with, a, with some believers and go support that church and then get you some training. Uh, you can do, uh, there's an awful lot that can be done through correspondence work now. Internet, good night. All kinds of Bible college uh, work available through the internet. And uh, a lot of good stuff out there. Or we've got a Bible. We've got uh, Temple Baptist Church in Powell, Crown College. I've known a lot of these young men going out there. And it seemed to me like they get a good education out there in the Bible. And, uh, and, and these are Bible-believing people out there. So, you know, you've got that right here locally. And uh, so uh, when he places a pastor in a church, he places that pastor in that church. And that pastor is not only required to be apt to teach, 1 Timothy 3, apt to teach. He needs to be able to teach. But he also has to be able to discern. Hebrews said he watches for your souls. And he has to be able to uh, stand up and, and, have the, and, and, and have the intestinal fortitude to preach the truth. If it may not, it may not be popular, but he's got to preach the truth. Uh, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. But he also has to have discernment. And discernment comes over years, decades of watching. Discernment's not an easy thing. Uh, one of the ways that you get discernment is to watch movements as they come along. You watch, you, watch, you watch things happen and then you look for the fruit of it. Always, folks, 
all don't take don't take the sparkle look for the fruit what fruit does it produce what fruit is your life producing what fruit when you're teaching young people in our in our in our Sunday school classes and here and, and brother uh, uh, brother Nafziger back here in the back what fruit is your ministry producing you judge a tree by the fruit it bears and so it's all important now the reason I said all that tonight is because if you come to temple any period of time you know that I'm not one who likes to get up here and brag on myself I don't like to do that and the reason I don't is because I want the Holy Spirit not to be grieved because that's all important if we grieve the Holy Spirit Folks, then we're going to have to do everything we try to get done in the flesh. You can't do it. You can't do it in the arm of the flesh. The, um, our secretary showed me a box, Miss Moreland, yesterday. She showed me a box of letters up there in that, little bit, in that little house above you up there. That box is this wide, that long, and about that deep. For one year, it is completely full. One and the lid won't even fit on it and we got a month left and that's more than we got last year it's growing every year her workload is growing because she has to answer that mail if I answered that mail I wouldn't have time to do anything God is blessing Temple Baptist Church he is he's blessing this church and, uh, and I tell you right now, I, I am, I'm humbled by it because I'm blessed by it. I am blessed. I, I don't deserve what God's done here at Temple. Uh, this past Sunday morning, we had 425 people. I'll take that back. We had 425 computers at one time, simultaneously, watching in this service Sunday morning. Say, so what do you mean by that? Well, how I many you don't know if you didn't have two or three or four? One man said that we're, they had, what was it, 300? 300 people watching one computer or one TV set of what's being streamed. That's what I'm trying to get across. In other words, 425, there's no way of knowing how many people were literally simultaneously watching what was going on inside this auditorium Sunday morning. You know, it could have been 1,500. It could have been 2,000. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Exactly. We don't know. We have no idea. And, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, I would have said, well, you know, folks need to get you a church somewhere. But that, those days are gone. They're not out there. I believe the people now. I really do. They say, Preacher, there are no churches where we live. And so, Temple Baptist Church is our church. That's a blessing, folks. God has blessed us. He has blessed us. These people send offerings. I have never asked for money. You look at the website, the line of Judah, you look at anything else that goes on the internet, I never ask for money. We're not on there. It's not about money, and they know that. That's why they send money, because they know we're not about money. You'll never hear me say, get up here and sow your seed. <laughs> I'm going to write one of them soon. I'm going to say, I sowed my seed into another ministry, but surely you can bless me, can't you? You know, that kind of garbage. No, we're not talking about sowing seed. We're talking about the Word of God. But they're sending money. God is telling them to send money. They're saying, I'm going to send my tithe. You're our church, so I'm going to send you our, my money. And so they send their money. And God blesses it, and He has blessed it. And I marvel when I, I think to myself, why is all this? Why all of a sudden now, here in 2018, are we getting all of this response you, you, get a, you get a distorted picture of this church when you come in here like tonight. It's completely distorted. <laughs> There's probably two or three times as many people watching right now than what's sitting in this building. 
You know, in other words, in other words, it, God's blessing Temple Baptist Church. Amen. He's blessing it. When was the last time you were in a service like you had this past Sunday morning? Folks, listen, I, I, I don't know how many thousands of times I've preached in 42 years, but the power of God was all over this place Sunday morning. I'm telling you. <laughs> I mean, it felt to me like I was being hit with 500 volts of power. It's just coming all on my soul. And it was just, I knew it was the Holy Ghost. He was just moving out upon people. What is that? What would you call that? What do you call that? Would you call that a revival? You better believe I would. That's the power of God. What's holding you back? <laughs> what, what's holding us back? Did we not have a good service Sunday morning? Has is, is God not showed us what he's able to do? And if you have a hunger for God, God will give you, you'll get as much of God as you want. Every one of us will. If you'll make an effort, if you'll make an effort, a real effort, and start drawing nigh to the Lord, he'll draw nigh to you. That's what James said. I'm going to read some emails for you tonight. Just a few. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I say, God bless you and I love you. All these folks out there. How do you pastor somebody in San Francisco? <laughs> you know, I mean, I can't physically be there, but we can, we can give them the word. Listen to this. Today I have completed listening to every single sermon and lesson on your website from Wednesday night, February the 6th, 2013 to the present. Good night. <laughs> Man, I, that's a bunch of sermons. Through your words, the Holy Spirit has blessed me with knowledge, insight, courage, and truth. Here's another one. I've been struggling with many things for a while now, and I really needed to hear this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. God bless you in Jesus' name. Another one. Thank you, Pastor Lawson, for exposing the new apostolic reformation. Now, there is my responsibility as a preacher and a teacher. We started studying them 20 years ago when their teachings had just begun to permeate the church. They are poison. Thank you for the time you take to study the things. Another one. You make so much sense and made me open my eyes on the ways of hell that I was living. I believe in God and Jesus Christ, but I wasn't living right. And I'm working on that day by day. I'm a work in progress, and I'd like to thank you. Greetings in Jesus' name. Just a note to hereby thank you for always being such an encouragement to me. I've been listening to your sermons for the past two or three years via YouTube. Uh, please forgive me for not being able to give uh, you an accurate account of how long I've been listening. However, your ministry has really impacted my spiritual life in a positive way way. In closing, I'm not sure if I'll ever have the privilege of meeting you as I live in Cape Town, South Africa. Another one. Thank you so very much for providing your sermons online. Uh, they've revived my heart. My local Baptist church, now listen to this, my local Baptist church has slowly been walking in inclusivism. There we go. I have seen it, not liked it, but with your teaching on the Bible, I have a great, greater clarity and understanding of the Word. Another one. Hey, Pastor Lawson, I find it very hard to maintain faithful church attendance. I'm an independent fundamentalist Baptist, but often these churches have a certain group of people that are... Now listen to this man. Often these churches have a certain group of people that are caustically critical of others, it's very stressful to be around people like that. I'm sick of listening to gossip about others. I'm tired of wondering what they might say about me. Now just remember that. When you're, hearing to that, when you're listening to that long tongue gossiper, it's because they're not talking about you right then. They'll get another ear and they'll wear you out. <laughs> the love for the brothers in Christ is supposed to separate us from the world, but it's nowhere to be found. Why can't we all learn to talk man to man and privately discuss improvement in our Christian walk? This is a sensible person. I don't need to hear about someone's issues if they haven't come to me about it personally. Amen. 
Right now, I'm only listening to online sermons and discuss them with my father. There are many people who can't find a good church. Do we have to show up to places like this anyway? See? I don't want to be part of a sick body. <laughs> Do we move? Do we look to the internet for spiritual food? If we look to the internet, aren't we supposed to be part of a local church? We need help. Thank you for doing God's work so faithfully when it's so easy to pass the buck. Here's another one. I want to thank you for your teaching and preaching. You gave me a, a better understanding of the Bible, also a good awakening and scare. Your first sermon I heard was about CERN and the LHC, that's the Large Hadron Collider. That after that I was petrified and I knew I needed Christ, even though I thought I was a Christian. Isn't that something? I realized right then I wasn't and needed Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Pastor Lawson, do not bang too much on social media. Hey, Pastor Lawson, do not bang too much, what I don't know what that means, on social media. I'm not on social media. Period. If anybody ever comes on there and says, this is Pastor Lawson, they're lying. I don't tweet. I don't Instagram. I don't Facebook. I don't whatever the rest of them are. Snapchat. Is that what it is? It may be, yeah. It may be. It's just a typo. Probably does. Makes more sense, doesn't it? Uh, okay. Bang with a typewriter. Yeah, that's two. That make yeah. She's smarter. Amen. She's... <laughs> she... <laughs> I think you're right on that. Pastor Lawson, do not bang too much on social media because I'm watching your videos and once in a while I watch you live all the way in El Salvador, Central America. Amen. One from South Africa. This is from El Salvador. I also reshare them. I love how the Holy Spirit teaches through you. God bless social media. Listen to this. I live in California. Pastor Lawson ran across this video a few weeks ago asking the Lord Jesus for a pastor I can watch on YouTube. Teaches the truth. We don't have churches like this here. My church has become too worldly and I hate the worship. It looks like a nightclub and the singing sounds like a nightclub. I just quit. <laughs> Amen. You mean you tell somebody not to go to church? Amen. Not that. That's not a church. Now listen to this one. Hey there, it's nice contacting you again. I ran into a church nearby where I live in Reading, Reading or Reading, Pennsylvania. How do you pronounce that? Reading or Reading? Reading. Reading, Pennsylvania. The church had the LGBTQ flag written on it. God is still speaking. You want to know what this church believes? What we believe. You remember that one? The United Church of Christ, now this is a denomination, is an openly diverse denomination that formed in 1957 when the Congregationalist Christian Church and the Evangelical Reformed Christian traditions merged. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ, the Trinity, the Old and New Testaments as the inspired Word of God. In the United Church of Christ, we take the Scripture seriously, but not literally. Listen carefully now. Calvary is an open and affirming, that's a buzzword. Anytime you see in the doctrinal statement of any church where they say, we affirm, here's what they do. We are an open and affirming congregation that welcomes people from all walks of life. We truly try to embody the extravagant welcome of Jesus Christ so that no matter where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here regardless of gender, marital status, sexual orientation, or cultural background. At Calvary, God truly is speaking. No, he's not, son. No. And for those of you out there who believe that just believing is salvation, these people believe. Do you think that's your brother and sister in Christ? No. No, 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 no. If you believe... According to the scripture, if you believe from the heart, receiving Christ as your Savior from the heart, you will repent. Amen. The fruit of biblical faith is repentance. Amen. And there's a crowd out there running around teaching, saying that you're adding works. It's all you have to do is believe. Do you know what I think about that crowd? 
I think what they're trying to do is to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. I believe that bunch is running around saying, well, I believe all this stuff, but you know, I'm free in Christ and I can live any way I please because I believe. No, you don't believe. From the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. And when that salvation comes from the heart, it will change your life. What do you think's changing your life? Repentance. You turn to God from idols to serve the true and living God. I'm, these people here are deceived, is deceived because here they list all the stuff. I agree with everything they believe. Do you believe in the deity of Christ? Amen. Trinity? Amen. Old and New Testament inspired word of God? Amen. But you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. Because a Christian would say, you need to come out of that lifestyle. You need the power of God. You need to forsake it, turn from it, and ask Christ to come into your heart. And if you'll do that, he'll save you and write your name in the book of life. Hello, Preacher Lawson. And I'll close with this one because it's beautiful. This, this man sent a photograph of his wedding with his bride. And it's a beautiful photograph. He's standing there with his bride, and I think the water's behind them. And I believe, that, if I remember, it was down in Louisiana. Yeah, listen to this. Preacher Lawson, I'm writing this to you because it has been put on my heart to do so with much desire to reach out and in fellowship extend my gratitude for the seemingly endless sermons your congregation has posted to YouTube. We do not post any sermons to YouTube. We have a lot of good brothers out there and sisters out there that post our ministry on YouTube and God bless all of them. Amen. Amen. I'm glad for that. But the church, Temple Baptist Church, does not post on YouTube. But anyway, your unapologetic and touchingly heartfelt style of deliverance, second to none. I'm a 39-year-old, recently born-again believer, who for the last 11 months, like a light switch suddenly being flipped on, have absolutely no desire for anything other than the true and fallible Word of God. At first, I didn't know what had happened to me but now understand exactly what took place inside my very soul. It's been an experience beyond my wildest dreams that such a thing like this really truly happens to people. My heart each and every day leaps with exceeding joy because all I can do is seems now is talk and pray and love on my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, all day long. Amen. Amen. I'm fortunate to have a good job that allows me to listen to you preaching the entire day while at work. Sometimes I'm so moved that tears start rolling down my face, not because I'm crying, but rather because of what's hearing the word, the only real truth in all the universe, I suppose, now, do, now does to me inside my very core. I've never had a real true hunger for anything of this magnitude in all my life and am just feeling so absolutely blessed to have been found by our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for telling it like it is and should be. Thank you so very much for that. Please pray for me and my wife and our two children as we embark upon this road to everlasting glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, patiently yet eagerly await his return. How my heart burns to awake each morning to the true word of God and to hear you preach. You've been an absolute blessing in my life. I'm sure many others. I've had to reach out to you and extend my appreciation for all that you do and have done. That sounds like a Christian. Amen. Compare him with that crowd up there that's affirming sodomy. Vast difference between the two. Amen. Amen. 1973, one evening, I was sitting on a sofa in Sandra Hayworth, John Hayworth's living room. We had called a deacon from Third Creek Baptist Church. He sat down next to me and he opened up the Bible. He read the scripture to me. He said, do you believe that? I said, yes, I believe that. He said, would you like to ask the Lord to save you? I said, yes, I would. But what got me there was deep conviction. He said, well, let's pray. I bowed my head on that sofa. I was 27 years old. I'd been to hell and back. I'd been everywhere. I was as dirty and low down as any man could be dirty and low down. I deserve to be in hell right now. I deserve to be in the lowest hell. <laughs> but I bowed my head. 
I said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save my soul. You can't understand how I felt unless you've been there. Because when I raised my head back up, <laughs> something had happened to me. Who would have ever thought just a simple prayer could change you like that? And that's all I did. I raised my head back up. And when I raised my head back up, something moved and flooded inside me. Something light came in me. I knew I had changed. Something was coming down on me. My sins were being lifted from me. My heart was being washed in the blood of Christ. I mean, I was changed. And that deacon said to me, he said, now if you died, where would you go? I said, I'd go to heaven. He said, why would you go to heaven? Because I asked him to save me, and he has right here. He saved me. I got up from there. Next morning when I woke up, I wanted to get into that Bible. I couldn't get enough of that Bible. I mean, I devoured that Bible day after day after day. I could not wait to get to church. Every time the church doors were open, I was right there. And I got right on the front row, got right in front of Bill Cardwell. And when Bill Cardwell would open up the Bible and start preaching it, I'd be sitting there right there taking in everything he was saying. I didn't know there was anybody else in the room. It was just me and him. And I was listening to what that old man of God said. And I did that. I went to work. Snyder Motors. I was a line mechanic. A Volkswagen line mechanic. And there's no boy down in the body shop underneath us. That's where the body shop was at Snyder's. Mechanic floor was second level. The body shop was on the bottom floor. I don't remember exactly how we came in contact with each other, but he was saved too. And man, we'd go eat lunch together. And, and we talk, that's all we talked about was the Lord. And did you know what? I didn't have any trouble with anybody else going along. Nobody wanted to go. <laughs> Just the two of us. Every once in a while, somebody else would go. But most of the time, <laughs> stay away from those two nuts. And boy, we enjoyed it. We talked about the Lord. Folks, that changed me. I'll never be the same again. And it's sweeter now than it was then. Bless his righteous name. If your pastor cannot give you a clear-cut testimony of salvation, get yourself another church. Or get rid of him and get you a pastor that's born again. I'm saying that to the dear folk out there and all over the country, wherever they are. Get out of there. If he can't give you a clear-cut testimony, how's he going to minister the word of God to you? can't do it bless his name bless his righteous holy name blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus bless his righteous name <laughs> some days all I want to do is just bless him <laughs> I just want to bless him I want to, some days I just think about him I say bless your name Bless your name, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I do that day in and day out, that day in and day out. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Day in and day out. If you get to where you can't pray and you don't feel like it, that, you, that, you, that you have anything to say, just get down and say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay, but when I first got saved, I listened to some of these preachers out here, and they were casting aspersions on that prayer. And I thought to myself, man, couldn't that? You've got all kinds of stuff you can preach on. What are you preaching against the Lord's Prayer for? Of course, you know, they say, well, the Lord's Prayer is John 17. All right, split hairs if you want to. But the Lord prayed that prayer, didn't he? said, when you pray, pray like this. Do it. <laughs> Learn that prayer if you don't know it. Pray it. Start talking to God. And you'll be surprised how you'll talk to Him more. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, I'm done. <laughs> I feel better, brother. <laughs>